it's now half past 10 at night. And he looks at me and he goes, well, thanks for that, Andrew. It's really been good having a chat and we've got a lot of good information and we can, <laughs> we can consider that. And I looked at him and I looked at his wife and I said, hang on, I came here to do a deal. I'm not leaving until you buy this thing. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, all right. Good to be here. <laughs> I have never worked no out laughing. at the start. No yeah, laughing. No laughing. Start. I heard the last session. No more laughing. <laughs> oh, you started me already. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, just to give a bit of context on how you came here, um, called you out of the blue and asked you to do a speech. Thought it was really good, and you actually made a huge impact on a flatmate of mine. Mm. And he... Uh, it's a rare occurrence. I think he said maybe three or four people in his life has right. made that impact. Mm. And it wasn't just so much your speaking ability, but the congruence. You know, it's like yeah. who you are and the way you express yourself mm. is aligned with what you're mm. saying, mm. which is a rare thing, especially in selling. Mm. Um, and there's probably some context around that in your story. Yeah. So why don't we give a bit of context to listeners and tell us how you came to be a sales coach and keynote speaker? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, that word congruence is a a good good one. I uh, remember one of my bosses said to me once, is the person you are on the stage congruent with the person you are in the street? And it always challenged me to be be that person, whoever you're meeting with, that if you're seeing me on a stage or in person, that you'd be that guy, you know? Mm. And and I think that's a challenge for all of us in in the world we live in. yeah, so a little bit about my story then. Yeah, yeah go yeah. ahead. So, uh, so I left school uh, in the 80s, and uh, I thought uh, I want to be an actor or a journalist. Mm. And uh, I ended up working in a dental supply company. So that was a little bit of a, <laughs> a shift from the original goal and dream of, of what it was. Um, my, my dad was uh, quite a successful businessman in New Zealand, and uh, he owned a company that owned this dental supply company. So my job at the time was throwing rubbish in a bin from a fourth floor story over the edge into a skip. Mm. And that was where I started. And uh, it was a holiday job. And it just happened to become a very long holiday in that uh, <laughs> I ended up working 34 years in this dental supply industry. And, you know, if I look back originally to what I intended and what I thought uh, I would do and to what I ended up being, it was just totally different. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you fast forwarded through that whole uh, career, there was clearly a um, always wanted to be speaking, always wanted – there was a dream in me. And I'm, I'm now 55 and, uh, you know, I'm uh, – now living my dream, mm. and I guess it's that that thought: I don't ever give up on the thing that you want, and keep pursuing it, and keep mindful of it, because uh, you will find it comes up along the track. And um, a lot of, I mean, uh, I don't know how specific we'll get today on in terms of the role and the job and uh, and that side, but um, I uh, always was aware that I wanted to make my own fun in in the job because. Um, even our CFO that I worked with, uh, I said to him, I am here far too long uh, in the day to not enjoy myself. And so I, I had to focus on, one number one, myself enjoying what I did, but also the team around me mm. uh, to be embracing that. And so, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the the dreams of being the actor and being the journalist, we, we, we ended up writing a book about the story of one of the companies I worked for. Um, wh- one of the companies I worked for was called Shell Foon Dental. And originally the company was started by two brothers, came out from Lebanon, the Shelfoon Brothers. And uh, way, way back in, in the history of Auckland, there was a band called uh, Epi Shelfoon, and, and they were related to these Shelfoon guys. And they uh-huh. used to play in a bar up in K Road. And uh, so I had this idea uh, during my dental career here in New Zealand. I said, why don't we form a band called the Shelfoon Brothers, record a, an album, and we'll turn up at the... Um, the dental conference and be one of their major sponsors. And so, of course, I went to the dental association, quite a conservative crowd, (laughs) and said, we've got this great idea. We want to record an album. We're going to show up at your gig on the Saturday night. We will play, and, uh, you know, it'll be awesome. And, of course, uh, I'm the manager of a company ringing with this proposition, and uh, 
there was a big deal of scepticism I had to get <laughs> yeah. through to get that gig going. But um, it proved to be one of the most memorable marketing exercises we ever did because uh, every every delegate got a CD in their satchel. Uh, there was uh, the band played and we came on at just the right time. It was 10.30. Everyone had had a few drinks. It wouldn't have mattered if we were the worst band in the world. We, <laughs> yeah. we did well, but it was, a, it was a great night. And, uh, you know, so those sorts of memories I have of... Of, uh, the, the work career that always bringing the the joy and the fun uh, element into the job because I figure we're all uh, we all spend so much time at work to be able to engage our customers in uh, ways uh, beyond the proposition of what we do and I, I know that's something that you do Ryan you know in, in the conversations we've had and and observations I have of what you do that uh, you're adding value beyond the proposition and so that's what you know was a very underlying thing of, of what I did through through my career. Um, it's fair. Well, I mean, there's also a story that you told in the, the keynote uh, speech that you did for us mm. um, that, you know, the journey isn't always a straight line and yeah. there are certain challenges. And a big space that you do a lot of great work around is around suicide prevention and, yeah. and that side of things. And I'm just wondering, I mean, up to you on how deep you go on it, but how to, firstly, was there situations where it was – like it was hard to see, you know, to get through it and then how you mm. actually work through that because mm. there's a lot of people listening that have had that sort of experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I uh, I often say to people, I had a charmed life. I grew up in Blockhouse Bay, uh, mum and dad and me and my sister. My sister actually was uh, severely disabled. She, was, uh, she had a, a disease called Friedrich's ataxia and basically it meant that her nervous system slowly shut down over a period of time. Mm. But she was quite an inspiring person in my life. But So apart from the, the trials that she was going through, I, I kind of joke, but the biggest challenge I remember as a young guy was uh, we were the last people in our street to have colour TV. Oh, and uh, I remember all the neighbours had colour TV. I'd go over and Doctor Who came on and you would saw you saw the opening titles in purple and yellow and go, wow, this is crazy. And I used to go hang out at the neighbour's house and I'd beg my dad, you know, and eventually we got a, a Philips K9. It was the TV that we, we bought and um, everyone in New Zealand at the time had one of those. And um, so, you know, I I remember thinking uh, in my younger days, people seem to have tough times in life, but I didn't have any. Mm. And and I actually started thinking as I got into my 30s, I started waiting for something bad to happen to me, you know, <laughs> not being negative, yeah. or, or, you know, but I, I started thinking, when's my tough time going to come? And then uh, when I'd, I'd moved to Australia, there was a, a six-year period of – quite a, a flow of uh, negative events in my life and um, started with uh, after uh, 22 years of being married I, I went through a divorce and uh, and I guess the thing with divorce is it, it, it doesn't matter whose fault it is or what happened uh, but there is a grief when you when you have a divorce from someone you're cutting a cord from someone that you've been and in, in my case I had three children who were in their adult stages and, uh, and you know having to leave the family home and move out and so that was that was quite a wrench um, a short time after that I uh, I moved into a, a Meriton apartment in Sydney and up in the, an area called Alexandria. And I don't know if you've ever been into a Meriton apartment, but they're like a white-walled oh, cell, yeah. brown carpet. Everyone is decorated the same. And I can remember um, the first Christmas being on my own. And I was lying on my bed, and I had this terrible, debilitating headache went on for a couple of weeks. And I remember on Christmas Day, I was lying on the bed and it felt like the walls were pulsating, like there was a heartbeat, you know, this ba-boom, ba-boom coming in towards me. And um, and I, I was smart enough to go to myself, ah, so this is what it's like, you know, mm. and that sense of depression, you know, and this overwhelming feeling of, whoa, here it comes. And uh, I was able to force myself up off the bed, go out, go down to Bondi Beach, sit on the on the beach and read a book on Christmas Day, you know, my first Christmas Day alone. And mm. I remember that, you know, and then... And then there was a you know a period of a, a whole bunch of things. My uh, my sister, who uh, her name was Helen, she um, she passed away in Auckland Hospital. So I came back from Sydney to see her, and um, I remember the last time I saw her in hospital and and walking out of the ward and uh, down the hall and thinking, this is the last time I'm going to see her, and this 
grief, you know. I, I kind of sobbed all the way back to Sydney on the plane. And, um, you know, a, a small family, so losing my sister, who'd who'd been really quite an inspiration in my life. You know, she was an absolute uh, legend in terms of inspiring others to believe in yourself, have faith uh, uh, against adversity, and always smiled, you know. So, so losing her was a big thing. And um, then uh, after 27, 28 years of being in this dental business that we spoke briefly of, uh, the, the CEO deemed that my role was to be made redundant. And, uh, mm. and I remember at the time thinking, wow, you know, I really went through a, a why me uh, phase of my life. And, um, you know, what, what I've learned actually since that time is uh, the why me actually needs to translate into the what now. Because mm. if you stay in the why me, you'll never reach the what now. Mm. And uh, I learned a really valuable lesson, and anyone who's listening today around being through redundancy, because many people have, I realized that business is just a game. You know, so we're on the field, we're playing the game to the mm. best of our intentions. I don't, I don't propose that we slack off. When we're in the team, we give it our best shot. So we're playing and we're passing the ball. But when that new coach comes onto the team and he goes, you know what, Andrew? I don't really want you on my team anymore. You know, off you go. I had no choice but to get off the field. But the great thing that I realize is I'm walking off the field. Who's on the sideline? But my friends and my family. And they are the ones that are always going to be sticking with you. So, you know, for me, business is a game. I play it well. But when I walk off the field, there's the real, the real thing, the life mm. that I live, the friends and the family. So yeah, redundancy was a bit of a bit of a hit, and then uh, after that, um, I uh, two years after my sister passed away, my dad passed away. So you know, it was quite a shock. the The family sort of uh, decreased uh, by by fifty percent. Uh, so you know, that was uh, uh, and and losing dad was quite a, a big grief to me. I was never super close to my dad, but I realised uh, when he passed away, actually, I he was the the guy that I looked up to and a. And a hero and a legend in my life, and so I went through quite a, a period of uh, grieving for losing him as well. So, so there was quite a quite a few, you know, bang, 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 these mm. hits hits on me. But the story got good because you've met my wife Kylie, and yeah, uh, lovely lady. seven years after all of this, got married. Love mm. of my life, beautiful wedding, fantastic honeymoon. Went down to Queenstown, had a a great time and um, just loving the start of our new life. Nine days in, I went for a sneaky ski up Coronet Peak. I'm driving back down the mountain. I get a phone call from from Kylie in the car, and I'd picked up a hitchhiker, and I was just dropping them off at the, the bottom of the mountain, so I didn't uh, answer the phone. Lesson number one in life to everyone, if your wife ever calls you, pick up the phone. <laughs> so, mm. uh, so I, I ignored the call. She rings back straight away, and uh, I said, oh, hi, darling, everything okay? And she goes, uh, Andrew, I think you better hurry home. I think I'm dying. And it was like, whoa. So uh, I uh, said, sure, I'll be there in a minute. I uh, get off the phone to her. <laughs> I remember ringing my mum and saying, I just got back from Australia. I said, mum, what's the number for emergency in this country? You know, I'd seen so many American TV shows. I thought, is it 911? Yeah, is yeah, it 111? Yeah. Is it zero zero zero? I don't know. Evidently, I've found out that they all work. If, yeah. if there's ever a problem, you can call any of those numbers. But um, as it turned out, uh, we got home and um, Kylie had had suffered a, a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a, a bleed on her brain. So she'd had a stroke on the left-hand side of her brain and uh, a, a, an aneurysm, a pop behind her um, her eyeball, which was the blood was blood was flowing. And, and I've learnt that blood is not good on the brain. We don't mm. we don't want blood going around the brain. It's good in other parts, but not around there. And so uh, three weeks in hospital, choppered down to Dunedin to start with and then flown up to Auckland Hospital. And uh, you probably know, you know, anyone who's in hospital these days, if you're in longer for a, a day, you know, you're having a baby and you've just had it and they're kicking you out already. So mm. I knew when she was in hospital for three weeks that this was pretty serious. Yeah. Um, so there was a series of these things. Uh, by the way, I always I always forget to say that Kylie's great now. You know, yeah, she's yeah, going yeah. well, <laughs> and uh, we're so pleased. You know that she's come through this difficult time, and you know we we're just uh, loving life and enjoying you know doing things together and. 
catching up with people like yourself. So the journey is 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 fantastic. But you know, I guess you know, coming around to the learning of all of that stuff, which is what you asked me. Mm-hmm. Very long, long winded answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you. Is that okay? Is that yeah, really? nah, you're good. Yeah. So um, so. There was probably, you know, with all that six-year period of stuff, there were four key things. Number one, always have someone to talk to. And uh, for me, uh, there, it was my mum, you know, and I was able to open up to her and say, hey, this is what my life is really like. And I and I realised that, you know, a lot of there's a lot of speakers like Brene Brown that talks about vulnerability and mm. our shame and all that sort of stuff. And there were some things in my life that I was embarrassed about, but I realised – when you talk to someone and really open up, everyone's been through the same stuff that you have. And mm. there isn't anything that um, you haven't been through that someone else won't have. You know, I remember with my kids, you know, one night I, I was at a restaurant with them and I said, guys, there's nothing that I haven't done that you, you know, that I haven't done 10 times worse than you have. So you can tell me sex, drugs, rock and roll, let's get it on the table. Mm-hmm. And they did. <laughs> yeah. Wow, out of game. I was like, right, oh, here we go. You know, so, so, um, and, and I think having someone to talk to, you know, was so valuable. Um, number two, having friends around, people that you could lean on. Um, and then the third thing for me that was a huge learning was uh, the ability to see my circumstances. And I realized this from a business perspective and also from a personal perspective that often, you can be in something and you're so far in it that you can't actually see where you're at until you get out of it. Mm. So if I give you a visual, uh, I was in a pot of casserole, stewing away. That was my life. I got out of it. I walked across the room. I turned around. I looked back across the room and there's a guy sitting in a pot of stew, stewing away. Mm. And I went, who's that? I went, it's me. You know, and it was just, it was the revelation, the ability to see my circumstances. Because when you're in something, you can't see it. Mm. So you got to get out of the bad situation that you're in, whether it's a relationship, a work situation, a, a family thing, a, a depression, whatever. You've got to be able to have the eyes to see the thing to, to move on. And then uh, the final point, I, I think, for me in terms of overcoming stuff was uh, – Kylie was in Dunedin Hospital, and I uh, went round the corner on day two for a, for a coffee. And I'm sitting in a, in this cafe in Dunedin, and I look across the room, and there's a young girl with her dad, and this girl is sobbing her heart out like that, <laughs> you know, can hardly mm. breathe type sob stuff. And uh, a voice in my head goes, "Go talk to her," and I go, I "Have an argument with myself?" I go, "No, I don't want to." Go talk to us, and I don't want it. <laughs> Voice goes. If you don't arrange to go talk to her, I'll get someone else to go talk to her. And um, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I sat there, and this girl gets up and she walks right by my table, and I knew I was supposed to say something. So I said, "Excuse me, are you okay?" And she said, uh, "No, not really." You know, eyes stained with tears. And I said, "Look, let me tell you a story." Uh, two weeks ago, got married to the love of my life. Beautiful wedding, great honeymoon. We're having a good time. Last Thursday, she's flown down here to Dunedin Hospital with a brain bleed and a stroke. And I said, I can tell you on that Thursday, that was not a very good day. It was a bad day. Mm. I said, on the Friday, we started to laugh. On the Saturday, we had a hug. On the Sunday, we're starting to talk about our life ahead and planning our future. So what I saw with every day, it brought a rate of improvement. It brought something better than the day before. It might only be a millimeter of improvement, but it was a rate of improvement over the, mm. the last day. And so I realized what I needed to do was have the ability to have the eyes for tomorrow, to be able to see into my tomorrow. Because if you're stuck in today, for a lot of people, today is a is not a good day. Mm. It can be a crap day, you know. So, so that ability to see uh, into tomorrow. So I said, I, I don't know if that means anything to you, to this young girl. And she said, Oh, yeah, it does actually. I've I've been really badly injured at school in a sports thing, and my spine's all twisted, and I'm going to have back surgery, and I'm really you know worried about it. And I said, Let me tell you from my own experience you're going to see that rate of improvement. It might only be a little bit, but every day it will bring that. So, you know, um, a big thing of uh, the, the, the mental health thing is the ability to see 
beyond tomorrow. Mm. And, and, and I think an, a valuable part of that too is the thing that happened to you or to me was an incident not a lifestyle. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people get stuck in thinking, oh, I'm depressed and I'm, I've am i got anxiety and, and they wear it like a badge, like it's their lifestyle. But mm. the things that happen to all of us are incidents along the road. They're not the thing that's going to define Ryan or Andrew as, as people, you know. Mm. Um, so those have been big, big learnings for me in that whole space. And I apply that all of that thinking that I've just shared with you to business or to um, my personal life you know it's the same deal rolls into rolls into either either area really you know and um, yeah i mean that makes complete sense i mean there's a book the e-myth and it talks about that um most business owners have a job not a business and that's because they aren't thinking outside of it they're in front of the coal face Mm. and uh, i like a, a sort of another viewpoint of that Everyone has the same emotions just for different reasons. Mm. So the whole why me thing yeah. is quite a, quite a dangerous narrative to get into Yeah, because um, no one can truly understand in your mind. Mm. Um, so the more you, you make it an individual experience and separate from others, the more you ruminate in that casserole. Mm. Mm. Um, also, on the, uh, I'm a big advocate for meditation and that mm. very thing you talked about, separating yourself from mm. the issue and observing it mm. is the key principle of mm. meditation. So mm. we actually observe the emotion as an object yeah. instead of buying into it. But I'd be interested as well. Like, so I've done a bit of sales sales management, and I don't like calling it management. It's mm. more about just helping people liberate their own obstacles so they can pursue the passion they want. Mm. Um, but I'd be curious in sort of how you would approach. Let's say you're going to consult a business and the sales team is is that is your role predominantly more the speaking role, or do you do the consultancy as well? Or yeah, so I will work with a sales team if they want okay. me to come in and work with them or I will do a sales training module and I'll come in and, and, and work with the team on that uh, perspective as well. So Okay, so how those. do you go about that? Uh, so uh, some of my clients uh, want me to come in and I will do a physical workshop with them, you know, throughout the day and we'll – I mean a big part of um, – Actually, there's a couple of parts that I find really resonate with sales team and with the managers. And one one thing that we've done, uh, which is very simple, which is along the lines of what is your story? And I realize that um, many businesses will talk about their product or their proposition in terms of the way they see it rather than the way the customer mm. sees it. And, you know, so we we do a simple exercise of saying, if, if, if I was to create like a movie commercial, uh, you know, 30 second of who you are, and I was to repeat that to the customer, would you be able to share a story that they would be able to repeat back to you? And, and in my book, Belief There, mm. um, one of the things that, um, that struck me, I remember hearing a, a story, and let's, I can't remember the exacts of the, the story right now, but went along the lines of, um, there's a company, we are smith roofing, we make mm. aluminium cladding, steel stuff, we build fences, and blah, 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 blah. So they, they went on with their proposition and said what they did. And that was fair enough, because that is actually what they did. But they recognized that their customers didn't really resonate with them. So they sat down and their story simply became, we are Smith Roofing, we house America. Mm. And, you know, suddenly Smith Roofing became this thing almost like a movement where – I want to be associated with a company that houses America. Yeah. Of course we want to be in with that. And so the the proposition goes from being, hey, what is it about us as the company to what's it about you as the customer? And when the customer gets that story, uh, that's quite transformational, I think, because everybody's buying into it. I mean, um, you know, we, we see it with many brands around the world. You know, Apple, Think Different. Mm. Hey, yeah, we want to be associated with a brand that thinks differently, mm. challenges the status quo. Yeah, I want to be in with those guys, you know. So so uh, helping teams and managers think about actually what is your story, you know. And, and, and if I was able to repeat back your story to you, you've got something. And what's more, if I was able to repeat your story to someone else and tell them that story, hey, you should go see this guy because he, you know, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. So that, th- there's that piece. And then um, another big piece of uh, the training that is really quite effective is what does the average sales day look like? From the moment you wake up 
to the moment you go to bed, what does it look like? And and what is what is what is the process? Is there a process to selling? And people go, oh well, no, it's actually you know all personality based, or you know it's this that or the other thing. But there is actually a process, and if you follow the process, it doesn't matter if you're the most analytical person or the mm-hmm. most boisterous, playful person or the most bolshy, powerful guy. Uh, you follow the process, you will you will win and you will get results. And um, so I, I spend a lot of time around the process of, of sales and, and what that looks like and um, work with clients in that. Uh, everything you've said, I remember it's in the first half of the book that I've read so far. Yeah. Um, it is genuinely a beautiful book because I remember you talking about that there's not necessarily something out there in that way, you know, in the, the old-fashioned sort of hard copy yeah. um, with the strong back. And then yeah. also the, the, you've got the illustrations. It reminds me sort of like the 20s, you know, like yeah. they, they drew it out. Yeah. And then there's one of the aspects you talked about in the book was around uh, a change in management style. So once upon a time, it used to be, you know, about the numbers, you know, in the mm. factory, everyone comes in, and there wasn't necessarily creativity that goes within mm. that. But now... Um, uh, there's a change in that landscape where mm. it's about liberating and creating creativity. Mm. So I'm just be curious in terms of the management style, like where do you sort of see the pitfalls and how people do it and sort of what what's some recommendations to change that narrative? Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a good question. And, and, you know, I mean, my thoughts and opinion on that may not necessarily be correct, but I'd, I'd probably flip it around and say what, what is the environment we're living in right now and, and, you know, what we've been cast into. So, you know, if we talked about the workplace alone, you know, we're sitting in an office right now, but mm. um, we know this, this year, I've spoken to a lot of people, the average person has worked four months this year. We're into month nine or 10 right now, mm. month 10 of the year. We've worked four months on average. Uh, so the, the view of the office has changed, you know, dramatically. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people who are telling me, you know, that the, the workplace of the future will be the hub. So you and I will have a project, we'll be working on a project, and I'll say to you, uh, Ryan, you know, this is your part, this is my part, let's have a coffee, and we'll catch up in two weeks' time again at the hub, wherever, wherever that is, and we will then go away and do our project. So I think the, you know, even the landscape of, of how we work and, and, and what, what we work in is going to change. I know, um, you know, talk about offices. My my family lawyer, uh, you know, he's in, in, in Auckland here. Mm. They've got an office down, down on the wharf, and they've decided they're not going to renew their lease. Uh, they've bought an apartment, mm. and they're paying a third less rent yeah. uh, on the apartment, and the... Uh, in 10 years' time, they'll own a house, you know. So um, the way that we're looking at things in terms of the actual geographics of working, you know, is yeah. is, is changing very quickly and, and dramatically. Um, I think in terms of the style of management and the way we communicate, uh, everything has to be a lot more... Uh, how how do we do this together? Mm. And um, you know the the authoritative style of leadership mm-hmm. in the past of there's the dictatorial boss who comes around and puts the fear in everybody. Uh, that 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 isn't. We know it's not going to work with the generation that's coming through. And, and I'm I'm a, you know I'm thirty years on you, <laughs> twenty years older. Um, you know, so I, I've been around. And I've seen that stuff. And I you know you know what's going to work. And it's. It's asking people for their commitment. And, um, you know, very much my first book, um, Business from the Heart, was all about that. I think everyone in the workforce, if you've been employed in a role, you probably know the right thing to do. So the role of the leader or the manager becomes very much getting your heart and mind engaged in that task. Because if you believe what I believe, then you're going to do it. I remember um, years ago I was over in Glen Dean at a pizza place mm. and it was the night of a rugby league final or something like that. And I'd ordered my pizza and I was waiting to pick it up. The guy answers the phone, the boss uh, picks up the phone and he says, oh, what did, whatever the name of the pizza place was. And, uh, and I heard the person on the other phone ask a question, something like, hey, is Ryan there? Oh, Ryan was the old manager, but he's left. And you could hear the person on the other end of the phone going, oh, okay, about to hang up. And the guy goes, you're watching the game there. He could hear what was happening on the other end of the phone. He goes, yeah, yeah. He's got got a few friends around, have you? He goes, yeah, yeah, I have. I've got my three friends. He goes, oh, 
Tell you what, I can have two large pizzas round there in 15 minutes. I'll throw in a Coke and a garlic bread. How does that sound? Done. The deal is done. And um, the, go- the guy hung up the phone and I said to him, I can tell you own this place. Mm. And he said, yeah, I do, but I want all of my team to be talking like this in the future. And, and you know, I think that's probably where I would see it. If you can have all of your team talking the same language mm. with a buy-in from not only the knowledge they have but the heart response, that's the, that's the winner for me, uh, the now and the future in terms of the, the way we structure and run our businesses, you know, much more – focused approach and, and buy-in. Well, I mean, it makes complete sense. I mean, I, I sort of come from the mindset that leadership isn't a title and that like in our organization, there's, there's each individual has their chosen competency and they get they get point voting rights in terms of that sense, you know, mm. like so Fiona's exceptional with understanding people and the customer experience. Um, mm. Rosemary's very good at the detail-orientated aspect and mm. finding finding things that could go wrong. Yeah, Greg's good at the big picture, business acumen, and financial planning. So, mm. At certain points uh, and stages of an idea, they come in and yeah. contribute. And there was also a story in your your book, Belief, uh, where you talked about you, you made a profound ex- um, impact on this young woman when you were going uh, to do a presentation and she asked, oh, what, what should we talk about? And you said, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, empowerment. Yeah, so, yeah, that was an interesting situation. We, uh, we had... Uh, Lost quite a few key exclusive agencies in a business, and uh, the, the the suppliers were coming into us quite regularly day after day, looking for reassurance. And uh, Rebecca, who was the the lady's name, she was one of our product managers, and we were going into the meeting, and uh, she said, uh, "What what should we talk about to the supplier, Andrew?" And and I actually didn't know. You know, I was thirty six, running a um, a $250 million company with 400 staff across Australia and I'd been thrown into this role and I was like, I was way out of my depth. Mm. And um, I, I said, I don't know, what do you think we should talk about? And Rebecca said, oh, I think we should say this. And I said, right, oh, that's a good idea. Let's say that. And, and we went to the meeting. Mm. And it was about seven years later that Rebecca came to me and she said, Andrew, remember that time we went into that meeting and you said, what should we say? And you didn't know and you, I suggested something. She said, that was the most empowering thing someone's ever said to me in my life because you gave me the freedom to, to, uh, to do something. Mm. And so, you know, just to be involved in that was so cool, mm. um, you know, like to be – part of that and, and I think you know you, you're bringing everything around to that place of, of leadership and what does it mean and that is it you know everyone's empowered everyone has that degree of autonomy you would wa- you would want to stay in a place like that and and for me that's that cheers experience you know you want to come back to a business like that you want to go back to a restaurant like that you want to go back to a clothes shop like that where they give you that good feeling and um, I get that coming in here you know, so uh, you, huh. you, you talked about Fiona and Rosemary. Uh, I know where Rosemary lives. Uh, she's told me she walks to work sometimes, and Fiona's <laughs> a bit of a character there. And within the space of two minutes of waiting to see you today, you know, you get that good feeling uh, and, that, and that people enjoy being here. Um, and not many workplaces have that. So hang on to what you've got. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I feel very lucky. I'll pass it yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. That, that's such an interesting concept and around the idea of empowerment. Yeah. Um, and there, I think we, we've got to pull the curtains back in terms of what success really feels like. And it's because um, at times I've noticed that uh, a sales team would pedestal someone that's an exceptional salesman or a leader. Mm. And they won't actually necessarily listen to the leader because it seems so out of reach. But it's their, their second in command, the person in the trenches with them. So if you can have that top-down, bottom-up sort of leadership, we're all in alignment. It makes a huge impact. But uh, be also pulling back the veil of success, there was a moment where you were told, um, hey, there's this new product, and you didn't know anything about it. And, that, well, you maybe knew some things. It was a $200,000 dental equipment. Oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I've set the scene. You paint the picture. Yeah, so uh, I, I remember I was uh, down uh, on holiday down south and my boss rang me and said, where are you? 
And I said, I'm down in Queenstown. He said, what are you doing there? I said, I'm on holiday because it was a multinational company. So he was calling me from Australia. He said, when are you going home? And I said, oh, maybe Wednesday. He said, I want you to go sell this thing, you know, so this is a, uh, without going to the specifics yeah, yeah. and the customer's name and everything, but um, it was a, a cone beam, three dimensional x ray, $200,000 machine. And I said, I know nothing about this machine. I don't know anything technically about it. He goes, it's all right, you can go sell it. I said, go see him. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay. So uh, I managed to contact the customer and he invited me around to his home. And uh, so I went out there and it was one of those balmy, hot summer Auckland nights. Got there. He's in his shorts and his best T-shirt and bare feet. And his wife was putting the kids to bed. And uh, we went down 7.30. We sat down and we started talking about this product. And I said, look to him, I said, look. I'm going to start the conversation by telling you this. I know nothing about this product, so don't ask me anything. <laughs> don't ask me anything technical about what this thing is or does, but I can tell you what it will do for you in terms of what it will add to your patience, what it will add to your profitability, uh, how it will change your life in terms of communication. And so we occasionally it slipped into product stuff, you know, and we, I said, you got to, I've got to push you away from that. And then we went back into the, uh, the features and, and benefits and stuff like that. But so anyway, the story goes that we've been there for quite a long time. There's a whole lot, bunch of papers all around on the floor. It's now half past 10 at night. And he looks at me and he goes, well, Thanks for that, Andrew. It's really been good having a chat, and we've got a lot of good information, and we can mm-hmm. we can consider that. And I looked at him, and I looked at his wife, and I said, hang on. I came here to do a deal. I'm not leaving until you buy this thing. And he looks at me. He looks at his wife, and his hand just comes over to me and goes, <laughs> righto. <laughs> and his wife goes, oh, thank God. And you know it was a it was a huge lesson to me because I realized in sales most people just want to be asked and you don't get asked yeah you know and and so the the greatest sales lessons I've always learned the most simple ask the person hey, yeah do you want to go ahead oh no actually no not at the moment I've got this thing on but yeah why not you know and um I think there's another very simple my my favorite sales story for me was uh, I, I had a hernia early on in my job as a manager. Maybe maybe the the hernia came with the job. I'm not sure, but um, I remember I was browsing around uh, um, Browns Bay, and I went into an optician shop, and um, I walked in the door, and this young lady comes up to me. She goes, "Hi," I go, "Hi." She goes, "Do you want to try on some frames?" I said, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> Of course I want to try on some frames. I'm blind. I've got glasses on. I've worn them since I was 18 months old, you know. Yes, I do. That's what I was thinking. I didn't say that. Um, but, you know, she she could have said, uh, can I help you with something? And what would we have said, Ryan? Uh, yes. Nah, well, I would have said, nah. Nah. Oh, I would, have would said, you? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, leave I me alone. Yeah, no, I would have said that. No, nah, I'm just browsing. Call. No, I'm just having a look. Yeah, no, nah, See true. you later. True. And, and you know, so, nah, but she call. said specifically, hi, do you want to try on some frames? It was that simple. Mm. You know? Hey, do you want to record a podcast? Hey, do you want to do this? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, you know? ask. So when you ask someone... Invariably, they're, they're only going to get two answers, yes or no. Yeah. And if they say no, so well, why not? You know, and and and, and so the the complication <laughs> and the mystery of sales, I I try to demystify a lot of that sort of stuff yeah, too. Yeah. You know, bring it back to normality. So that's fair. I mean, there's there's endless stories. Like you you come in, you're talking to a prospect, and you're like, this is this isn't going to work. You start, and you're like, no 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 no. You got you always got to go through the process. You always got to. So there was a story. Um. A uh, guy I work with, uh, he went into this. Uh, so it was a high-end medical product yeah. we used to sell. Not cheap, cold call, rock up, and you right. got to turn it into something. So yeah. he walks in, and um, there's like cars all over the lawn. The house is run down. It's like disgusting. Mm. Mm. And he walks in, and then um, so we actually had to massage people's feet for a living, yeah. which yeah. was actually yeah. quite, quite an amazing experience because you're intimately getting to know someone in immense pain and helping mm. them. So he started doing it, and then someone comes in and interrupts them. And it's and then it, he's got like 
six to ten people there and they all look like they're on the benefit and he's like oh what's going on here and it's like maybe they're in the gang or something and so he goes through the whole process yeah. and it's what three four hours and it's like late at night and he just doesn't 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 see anything coming out of it yeah and then they they start looking at each other and they start thinking oh we could get this and he's like well how how do they think they can and it turns out that they just recently inherited a whole lot of money yeah and it was the biggest sale that he ever made yeah, yeah. um so it's, it's certain points where it doesn't feel like it's going somewhere but the only way you know for sure is you ask yes yeah that and he always he had this um Great strategy that I highly recommend, which is a takeaway, which is the mm. fundamental, you know, the fear of loss. You know, you give it and then you, they're like, oh, I might miss out. Yeah. So what it is, so on getting that yes and no, you go on to the, talk to the people, you go through the process and they ask you, I oh, actually, we want to think about it. Mm. Mm. And you say, well, yeah, it's fine. I understand. Mm. Like, I mean, but what I've learned is whether it's one minute, one hour, one week, the answer is always the same. So mm. how about I just walk out? Um, you mm. guys talk about your, talking among yourselves. You have three answers. Mm. One you can say no. Mm. One you oh one you could say yes. One you could say no. Mm. So there's two options, and I'll just go back and come back, and you tell me. Yeah. So it's it's true. It's, I mean, sometimes people don't have the luxury of your product knowledge and your experience and mm. knowing, mm. believing in your product. Mm. So you need to help them and facilitate that. Yeah. But how do you navigate that? So a lot of people would feel uncomfortable asking or uh and feel like they're imposing or pushing because what you initially said when you said well i'm not leaving without an answer a lot mm. of people would think okay you're at their house that's mm. quite intimidating mm. blah blah mm. blah mm. how do you navigate that in terms yeah of i sales? mean well i was able to read the situation yeah. just like you know us having a chat now so you that's part of the skill of the salesperson and i would say uh, actually by the way your story good story you know around um not judging the person by mm. their appearance mm. um you know w w you're you're a young fella but do you remember pretty woman with julia roberts and um i remember Richard, cuts yeah. of it yeah. yeah so there's a scene where um she's a, a prostitute basically and she goes into a beverly hill shop to shop and the d the day one uh she is shunned and pushed out because of the clothes she's wearing you know they kick her out of the shop almost and you won't have any money Day two, she goes in with Richard Gere and, uh, you know, he says, we are going to be spending an obscene amount of money in this shop. So I want some serious sucking up, you know, and uh, it's quite a comical <laughs> scene, but um, they end up buying all this stuff and, and he shuns the, the, the shop that they first went into. But um, you know, so I never judge judge a person. Mm. So, um, but uh, we, 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 I got a bit distracted, <laughs> a bit distracted there on the, on the on, was it the technique we were? Um, yeah. How do, how do you navigate the feeling oh, yeah. as though you're imposed? Posing. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I've got. I mean, I've got a pretty blunt answer on that. Mm -hmm. That's the job of the salesperson. That's what they're employed to do. So I will say to a salesperson, "It's your job to change the weather. It's it's raining outside. So how are you going to make it sunny? That's mm -hmm. what you do. Mm -hmm. You 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 change the situation. And so, um, yeah, as you've learnt in in your time, and I've learnt in my time. Uh, questions, a bucket load of those things, mm. you know. I want to find out as much about you and this place and what you do, and I might then discover, hey, Ryan, I've got something that I can offer you, and this is it. So the only way I'm going to dis uncover what you need or, or want is uh, to ask you a whole bunch of questions, and normally they're those open questions, the what, why, how, when, who type mm. questions. I, I don't want to limit your responses, so I want to make sure you're going to give me as much information. I remember I was out in uh, Perth calling on a customer with the, the sales rep, and he said, I've been calling on this guy for three years. He never tells me anything, and mm. I never get to see him. Mm. I said, okay, let's see what happens. So I uh, went in and did just that, asked him a whole bunch of questions. We were there for 45 minutes. The guy never gets to see him. We're out the back. We're chatting. We're finding about his hopes, his dreams, his goals for his practice, when he's going to buy a new dental chair. And we walked out of the uh, practice into the car park, and the sales guy said to me, what just happened then? Mm. You know, I've never even got to talk to the guy. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> that's just what I do but when it becomes natural that you just ask people questions you know and and what what's everyone's favorite subject themselves yeah yeah so you know if I can get you talking about you mm. and you're comfortable about talking about you you're going to tell me everything <laughs> yeah you know yeah. you're going to tell me all your problems and you know uh, 
we've we've heard some shockers and some and some amazing things and and when we started to uh, encourage our sales team in Australia to think this way I remember I got a call from one of the girls up in Queensland she said Andrew incredible I've been calling on this guy for 7 years and I've never he's never told me anything we took him out for dinner and asked him open questions. Tell me about you, your hopes, your plans, your dreams. What are your financial goals? What are you stressed about? What are, what are your plans for retirement? Suddenly, said I learned more about that guy in one hour than I had in the whole seven years I'd been calling mm. on him. And a customer is happy to reveal to you their heart, their mind, their soul. Yeah. But you just got to Ask, Ask them. Yeah. And, and, you know, as I say, I'm a bit brutal on that. That's the job of the salesperson. A salesperson changes the weather. Yeah. I, and I won't back down from that. That's a, Fair. you know, go change the weather, guys. You know, that's what you do. And, and you know, and I think the leader too, the sales leader or manager, uh, what, boss, whatever you want to call them, they their job is to change the weather too in the hearts and minds of their, their team. For sure. Well. Yeah. And just, just to stack on that from a tactical standpoint, I mean, it, the whole premise behind the book is belief and mm. the first person you've got to sell the product to is yourself. And then also if you're adding in a, a, a deep and understanding of that person, their needs, and you're actually based on that, feeling comfortable that you're solving that problem combined with your belief – I think would make you feel justified and wanting to change the weather. If there's some sort of disparity between what you believe and what you're saying, mm. that's when I think the, the imposter side of things comes through and feels like you, you, you can't push the sale. Mm. Um, but I'd be interested as well, like, I mean, selling, have you noticed it change or do you notice that people are going more of a direction? Like when I was going through it, it was always about a polished script and memorizing mm. it and saying it and saying it to enough people mm. that it works. But mm. uh, I'm finding I'm going more the direction of the art of not selling. Mm. So it's not going through a pitch. You have a system and understanding of your product. You know your competitors mm. more than anyone else does. Mm. You know your features and everything, but what you're actually doing is understanding them and trying to be more authentic. Mm. So have you seen a landscape change or has it been the same? Uh, well, I, I, I very much believe that the, the new landscape we are living in is going to be based on the successful people who will always do well in business. Number one, you're going to be good with people. Mm. And, you know, when um, you first contacted me to speak on your mm -hmm. uh, session the other night, um, straight away over the phone, I liked you. You know, like as soon as I heard your voice, I started laughing. I thought this guy's a bit of a character, and uh, you know I'd be happy to come and help you and support you and mm. and and whatever you're doing with your clients. So it was all about adding value. So that that uh, people confidence thing, and as you say, that is not contained by a script. You know, the the script does not hold you to the thing. So you can free flow from the the confidence that you have around people to lead it where you want to go. And yeah, I totally agree with you that the, the future is around uh, people who are confident, who, who believe in their proposition and are, are solid in that. And the, the premise of the book um, was all around, there used to be a saying that a sale takes place when there is a transfer of enthusiasm, your product or service, into the heart or mind of your customer. And so really I just changed that because I, I, I realized you can be enthusiastic about something. Hey, Ryan, you got to go see the new James Bond movie. It's coming out in November. It's going to be awesome. And I find out actually you hate James Bond. You don't like <laughs> Daniel Craig. You, don't, you like documentaries about, you know, South American wombats or, you know, whatever. But, you know, so it's the um, – understanding what you need so so the belief thing comes in and the change on that phrase a sale now for me i believe takes place when there is a transference of belief in your product or service into the heart and mind of your customer so um if i am coming to you with a proposition that you know ron i really believe in this you know and you can see it you can feel it mm. and if you believe it half as much as i do what's going to happen yeah, you'll, you'll convert. Yeah, we're going to make a sale. Mm. It's going to happen. But if I'm coming to you, I might come to you with a whole bunch of enthusiasm but no belief. Mm. And um, you're going, well, this guy's a, you know, he's got a whole lot of hot air, but I don't think he really believes it, you know. Mm. And um, so that that is a huge part of um, our future, I think, in, in terms of commerce and reality and living on this planet, that that belief will propel us 
into our success, you know, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge thing for me. Just, yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 having that satisfaction and joy and belief in yourself from mm. a mental standpoint mm. is is quite a liberating experience. And yeah, it's. I think it'd be a, a good good time to close it out on sure. that. Um, so I'd be curious in terms of. So what I'll do is I'll include a link. I think they can buy your um, book on your website from yes. checking that. Yeah, both books are on there, yeah. Both books. Yeah. And uh, we'll see if we can get on to them about an audio book. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to do that, yeah. But what would be one, your closing remark that you would want to instill in the hearts and minds of our listeners? And then also how can they find you? Mm. Um, well, I mean, my biggest discovery really in life is uh, right from the age of five. I always knew the right thing to do, but mm. did I do it? You know, there's an instinctive thing that right from when we were on grandma's knee or mum and dad's knee when we were little, we were taught everything we need to do to navigate a successful life, but did I do it? No. And so um, for me, business from the heart and everything that I roll from comes from a place which says uh, when the things you know become the things you believe. That's when the real change happen. So the short story, I've, I've often shared the GP that sits in front of his patient says, do not smoke. It's mm. very bad for you. And then while they're out uh, paying their bill, he's in the alleyway lighting up. Why does he do that? Because in his head, he knows, hey, probably not the best thing for me to be doing, to be smoking, but it hasn't translated to his heart where he goes, you know what? He's absolutely right. And tomorrow... I'm going to stop that and I'm going to change my life. And that is when every major place of improvement, miracle, whatever you want to call it, magic in my life has happened when the things I knew translated to my heart level. And that's what business from the heart really is all about. Um, taking the stuff you know and applying it and going, you know what, I'm going to do it. And when you do it, bang, mm. you got a you got an exciting life ahead. And um, so, yeah, you can find me on uh, andrewhoggard.com. Uh, I have these two books, Business from the Heart and Belief. I love to uh, speak around, um, number one, personalities. Uh, the, the four distinct types of personalities is one of our talks. Business from the Heart is another talk. And then the sales training modules that I offer. So Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the hardest things is you got to be aware as a, a business owner that you're not necessarily the best person for the job mm. and, and outsourcing in, in, in the areas that you could work on. Um, and selling is it, your front of house. You know, it's, it's the interactions they're having with your customers. And if that doesn't flow through to the customer service experience, I mean, word gets out, especially now with social media. So, mm. yeah, I, 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 yeah, I rate you. Um, genuinely from the way you wrote that that book was really really encouraging i read it at 11 p.m yeah. so that says a lot that i managed to get through half of it <laughs> no, thanks Ryan. um and yeah check it out and there will be um i'll make sure your your website and things are in the description and yeah, it's been a pleasure great speaking with you thank you thanks mate and also wait nz audio editors.com uh, in case uh you you don't have the free-flowing great intelligence and articulate way of which you communicate like Andrew and you make the odd mistakes well it's good to have someone that fixes them so check out nzaudioeditors.com because if you actually meet me in person my voice doesn't sound this good so alright thanks guys